What's up Falcons Nation? It's your boy Ju coming at you with another Atlanta Falcons video. As always Falcons Nation rise up. It is Tuesday and I want to do a quick video. Um, it was some changes that came out yesterday. Um, some coaching changes and some coaches that were moved around. Um, I did do a video yesterday of my Atlanta Falcons news and notes and then a couple hours later it was breaking news. Um, and Dan Quinn had his uh, press conference that he has every week. And he talked about some coaching changes that were made. Uh, Raheem Morris um, now will be moving from the wide receivers coach. And he'll be the running backs coach. Oh, actually, he'll be the DBs coach. I apologize. Um, Bernie Parman, uh, Parmalee will be the running backs coach. He's coming over. He was the assistant special teams coach. And Dave Brock is now the wide receivers coach. So um, out of these changes, the biggest change that I see um, was the Raheem Morris change and I love that change um, to move him from wide receivers to the DBs if you know anything about Raheem Morris um, previously like his history he's a defensive minded coach like Dan Quinn um, he was the head coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers years ago um, he cut his teeth in this league as a dis uh, defensive coach and when he first came over um, as an assistant with the Falcons with Dan Quinn he was also a uh, defensive coach so he's now just moving back over to the defense from the offense. I do believe that this is a great move because, as you know, our DBs is a very young group back there. They're probably one of the youngest groups, uh, DB groups in the league. Um, we have three rookies. Uh, Isaiah Oliver um, is a second-year player, but we have uh, Kendall Sheffield. That's a rookie. Jordan Miller, that's a rookie this year. Um, we still have Desmond Trufant. He's a veteran, though, back there. And Bleedy Ray uh, Wilson. He's also a veteran. So very young group back there. But we got the, the guy, Jamal Carter. He's up, um, the backup safety. We have still have Kamal Ishmael. You know, he's a veteran guy. And Ricardo Allen's a veteran guy. And, of course, Keanu Neal at this point is considered a veteran guy. So we still are very young, um, far as, especially at the corner position. Um, and don't let me forget DeMonte Casey as well. DeMonte Casey is a young player, uh, a young guy still, too. So... I think Raheem Morris is going to really rub off on these guys. I think he's going to an uh, excellent communicator. Um, not to say that Gerald Henderson, I believe, who was coaching the DBs, isn't a good coach. I don't want to say that, but I believe that Raheem Morris is a better coach. And I think he communicates better with his players. Because one thing that I noticed, and you may have picked up on this too, is the communication with the secondary just hasn't been there. Um, and sometimes with the linebackers, like with Devondre Campbell and stuff, it hasn't been where it needs to be. But I know with Seattle uh, on the goal line, they were able to get two easy touchdowns with to D, uh, DJ, DK Metcalf, uh, the receiver, the rookie receiver that they have, where he was basically uncovered by anybody because we had guys in the end zone running around, not knowing where to line up as far as the DBs go. Um, guys guarding, multiple guys guarding the one player. In those scenarios, some guys not guarding anybody. They're just standing around confused, and then bam, touchdown. So I do think that this is an excellent move for Raheem Morris. Um, for the other two switches, uh, Coach Parmalee that will be taking over, or Parmalee that will be taking over the running back's room. Um, I don't know too much about him, so I'm not too sure going from assistant special teams to being a running back's coach. Um, one thing I can say is they do have a veteran in that running back's room with Devontae Freeman. It's a lot of experience there. And with the fullback that we have, Keith uh, Smith, he's been, been around as well. Um, but, you know, we still have a lot of young running backs as well with Quadra Olison, Brian Hill, um, Edo Smith are still young guys. But Devon, as long as Devontae Freeman, you have an uh, elder, stakes, uh, elder stakesman in the room that can help the young guys uh, continue to develop. Um, and I'm not too sure about Coach Brock either, uh, coaching the wide receivers. I think that it'll be a decent move, moving him over to the receivers. Good news is in the receivers room, we have excellent leadership with Julio Jones. Uh, he has a immense um, experience at this point. He's well-versed in running routes and things of that nature. Uh, well-versed in coaching up players as he helped coach up Calvin Ridley all last season and still is uh, assisting Calvin Ridley at this point to better him so i do like the switch of the uh definitely of the raheem Moore switch i believe that some of these changes should have happened earlier 
But as you know, with football, I think the reason that the changes didn't happen as early as we wanted is because our bye week wasn't until the middle of the season or week eight. So it's kind of um, hard, excuse me, making these wholesale changes, like switching coaches, the uh, position coaches in the middle of a work week, meaning when you have a game coming up because you have to, your players have to still get their treatment, you have practices. You have walkthroughs and then you have still how to consider time for travel if you're playing an away game. So it's a lot of things that go on during a, a work week and then you still have to come up with a game plan for that particular game that's coming up. So it's kind of hard to make those um, full switches like switching a, um, a positions coach in the middle of a work a work week or when you have a game that following like on that Sunday that week uh, that week at the same week as you're making the changes. It's kind of hard to make those type of changes. So I think. That's the reason Dan Quinn waited, and that's the reason that it took this long for these changes to be made is because Dan Quinn was possibly waiting for the bye week to try to get things figured out. So, like I said, I like the move with Raheem Morris. We're going to see if his secondary improves, um, but I definitely like Raheem Morris better than Coach Henderson um, in my my perspective. Just knowing how long that uh, Raheem Morris has been around and how he's like a player's, the ultimate player's coach. Um, I think these younger guys are going to continue to develop. Not saying that, like I said, that Coach Henderson was doing a bad job because to me, he was doing a decent job. The guys, uh, Isaiah Oliver and Kendall Sheffield, have grown leaps and bounds since the first time that they stepped on the field, especially Isaiah Oliver. I've seen a huge jump from game one to game eight uh, from the last game we played against the Seahawks. Isaiah Oliver looked like a totally different player. He was turning his head around when the ball was coming. He was actually deflecting uh, passes. He almost had an interception on one of those plays. So he's definitely doing better, a lot better than when from game from now, from game one to game eight. He does look a lot better. Kendall Sheffield has uh, started, I believe, like three or four games at this point because True Font's been hurt and he has filled in um, and been pretty solid as well. So I'm definitely. Um, Excited about these switches and to see if it can give our team a um, a boost at this point, or give our team you know any kind of uh, boost or jolt or spark anything at this point that we can get, we'll take it. Um, also, what I would like to jump into is talking about. Um, I got one of my uh, fans of the page or one of my subscribers asked me about Thomas Dimitrov, and I think it was an excellent question. He was asking me like. Should we fire Thomas Dimitrov or after this season? Or what do you think about Thomas Dimitrov? And it kind of hit me because you kind of forget about Thomas Dimitrov and the whole media spiel about firing Dan Quinn. You don't really hear anything about firing Thomas Dimitrov. All you always hear about is fire Dan Quinn. But when I got the question, it's very interesting. And when I went and looked up like the job of the GM, it's mainly the job of the GM to get the contract for the players to help draft players and things of that nature to scout players. So I feel like Thomas Dimitrov um, is a lot to blame for where we sit right now as the Atlanta Falcons, especially with not going out and signing marquee guys. Like when it comes to the pass rush and anybody really, I feel like um, a lot of stuff is pent on Dan Quinn, but now that I look at it, it's possibly more of Thomas Dimitrov's fault than Dan Quinn's fault of this lost season. And the reason I say that is Thomas Dimitrov is the main one who basically pulls the trigger on draft picks. And when we complain about guys like I complain about not having enough defense alignment, bigger defense alignment, like nose tackles and things of that nature, that really would mainly fall on the head of Thomas Dimitrov because he's making those picks. It's not Dan Quinn. A lot of the times we get confused and think that it's the, the coach that picks hand picks the players but I believe general, uh, generally it's the GM or the general manager that is making those final calls and those final decisions. So when it comes down to like signing guys like a Eric Berry that we've been wanting to sign, like fans been wanting to sign, or signing that big marquee uh, pass rusher like a Von Miller or back in the day like we had John Abraham, I feel like we definitely are missing um, good players in the trenches. And I had one guy in a couple of YouTube I've seen that talks about how Thomas Dimitrov always brings in like bargain guys instead of signing like a premier player or a premier pass rusher or a shutdown corner or a lockdown safety. 
it seems like we always go with the cheaper. We always take somebody else's trash, basically. We always go on the cheaper route. We always get these guys like uh, Alan Bailey. Not saying he's trash, but we always get guys that are like back in the day we had got that guy Ray Edwards. Like we always get like secondary or second tier or third tier guys instead of going for the one tier guys. Like if you look at what the Green Bay Packers did, you know, they've been struggling the last couple years on defense, but and they needed pass rushers. So they let go of Clay Matthews. They went and got Preston Smith and Zadarius Smith from the Ravens. And look at how good their defense is playing. It's playing a lot better, a lot tougher. Um, they're a lot better in the trenches. And you, you know, for years and years and years, the Green Bay Packers uh, mantra was we develop players. We don't go out and sign marquee free agents and big name free agents. But the the NFL that we now live in, the day that we now live in with the NFL, you definitely want to go out and sign marquee players if you have the money to do it. If you have the money to do it and you can afford a player, we should have went after like a, a Nadama Kansu or we should have went after, you know, those big name of Von Miller, maybe in a trade or we should have went after one of those guys like those surefire guys, because this is my thing. I never have a problem with um, trading or um, signing somebody that's proven. Like the year that we signed the White Freeney, it was well worth it. We went to the Super Bowl uh, when uh, John Abraham was actually playing for the Falcons. When we got him from the Jets, he was not even like young at that point. He was a mature player. He was an older player, but he still was productive. And that's the main issue that I'm seeing with a lot of these players is we're signing guys, but they're not being productive. And we need to um, do a better job in our scouting. Um, as Thomas Dimitrov, we need to do a better job at in free agency at signing guys. Because one thing that I noticed, um, I've been watching football, like I said, a long time. But one thing that I've been noticing this year as I'm watching the football is the teams that go out and make those acquisitions are the teams that are in the running. Like if you look at the Rams, they went out and got... Jalen Ramsey, you know, they feel like they're close, like they're Super Bowl ready. Um, so they went ahead and sacrificed their draft picks. Not saying that it was worth it because they may, I feel like they may have gave up too much for Jalen Ramsey. But one thing that I can respect is sometimes it's hard to find that surefire, surefire player in the draft. Like it's no guarantee with those first round picks that they gave up to get, uh, they gave to the Jaguars to get Jalen Ramsey that it's going to be another Jalen Ramsey coming out of college. Like when you got an all pro player and they're like a top five player in a position, sometimes you have to roll the dice and uh, Jalen Ramsey is definitely a top five uh, defensive back in the current NFL. So it was a, it was a great pick for them or a great trade for them because they're able to get a shutdown corner, a lockdown corner and add to uh, that defense that they have Um with Aaron Donald. So it was an excellent, uh, to me, that was an excellent uh, trade for the Rams. And it was a good trade for the Jaguars because they're not necessarily in a win now mode and they were able to get some more young pieces to continue to build their uh, team over there in Jacksonville. So I feel like the same thing with the Steelers. Like, I don't know why the Falcons and Thomas Dimitrov never goes after marquee guys. I understand, like, in some of the inst instances, we can't afford some of these guys, meaning our cap, like we're basically cap strong at this point. Like we don't have a lot of cap space. But when you trade for players, I think the, the salary drops a little bit, even though eventually you're going to have to sign the players. Because I, I don't know why, but I really wanted the Falcons to go after um, uh, another safety or like a, someone who can help in the secondary. And if you look at the Steelers, when they, Minka Fitzpatrick was open on the market with the um, – from the Dolphins, the Steelers pulled the trigger on that move, and it was an excellent pickup for the Steelers. Even though they let go of some draft picks to get him, I believe that the draft picks that they gave up was well worth it because Minka Fitzpatrick the other day had a pick six, and I think he has like three or four, maybe four to five picks since he's been traded to the Steelers. And I can definitely see the difference in the Steelers' defense because Minka Fitzpatrick is a game, a game changer. He's um you know he's a special um a special talent so I feel like the special talent out there on the table where somebody's offering up a player especially on defense because we really need defensive help don't be afraid to go ahead and roll the dice 
Like in this offseason, we definitely need to think about drafting, like I said, a defensive tackle or maybe even bringing in um, a star player for somebody else's team. Like I said, a Nadama Kansu, if he's a free agent, like whoever's the free agents out there, we need to definitely take a look at these free agents and try to lure them to Atlanta because – when you, these players that we're we're getting, these second-hand guys and these third-string guys or second-string at best guys, they're just not cutting it right now, man. They're just not cutting it. We brung back Adrian Claiborne. I've always been a, a fan of Adrian Claiborne. But it's just like we possibly could have spent that money better. Um, we spent all of that money on Vic Beasley, which I understand because we thought, you know, this could be a proven year for him. But we gave him like $12 mil, twelve million. Because I think we actually like franchise tagged him or something. So, or we just gave him like the one year option where he had still left over, which was like a a twelve million dollar uh, hit. So, we definitely um, with Thomas Dimitrov. To me, his de- his job definitely should be on the line because one thing that I never thought about is maybe Thomas Dimitrov is not getting the proper players or not drafting the, the type of players that Dan Quinn needs to run his defensive scheme. That's what I'm, it looks like that I'm seeing. Now, I know a lot of guys are young still, like the DBs and stuff like that, and I talked about they're going to um, make rookie mistakes and make mistakes because they're still learning. But some of this stuff, like I feel like uh, Thomas Dimitrov needs to be held, if not – more responsible the same amount of response at least 50 50 with dan quinn because of the some of the moves some of the people he signed some of the people he hasn't signed that he should have signed like i think thomas dimitrov definitely should also if dan quinn is on the chopping block i feel like tom thomas dimitrov definitely needs to be on the the uh block with him and you know i'm saying it's no excuses um like i said i feel like sometimes And I even make this assumption that we forget that sometimes players like Dan Quinn and stuff like that don't get to choose what players they want to to play. I believe how it works is Thomas Dimitrov pulls the trigger, of course, on the draft picks and things of that nature and who we can afford to sign and who we're going to sign. But I've been hearing some rumors. I don't know if it's true, but I've been hearing some rumors that um, Thomas Dimitrov, the only reason the Falcons re-signed uh, Vic Beasley last season was because um, the only reason we signed, um, I've been seeing stuff saying the only reason that we signed Vic Beasley is because CAA, who he is, who's his agent or his company, his agency that he's with, um, his agent is with CAA. I heard that they basically wanted Thomas Dimitrov to go ahead and let, uh, sign him at that $12 million hit or cap and then... Um, then we was going to try to, um, get cheaper deals, like with somebody else that's with CAA. So like basically CAA made some type of deal with Thomas Dimitrov. Like if you guys go ahead and sign Vic Beasley to another contract or one year contract, um, we'll go ahead and give you a discount with the, with another player that's with CAA type deal. So it was kind of like signing a little shysty. Um, and it's definitely something that I think. We should have considered, meaning far as letting Vic Beasley walk. Um, I understand why we brought him back, but I feel like if Thomas Dimitrov did resign Vic Beasley just because he wanted to uh, save on another player that we may, you know, that we may have under CAA, I feel like that wasn't the right move to make. Like you never want to leverage your future based off of a player that's currently playing, uh, currently playing, especially not a Vic Beasley. So. With that being said, I also think sometimes we we forget that um, the coach doesn't make those type of decisions on what players he has. He has to do the best he can with whatever the GM gives him. Because I've been seeing a lot of people giving Kyle Shanahan adulation, which is well-deserved because their team is 8-0 for the 49ers. But what you got to realize is uh, Kyle Shanahan did not build that team. He's just the uh, head coach, and I believe he's also the office of coordinator for his team, but he doesn't pick the players. Uh, the GM there is John Lynch, who used to be a longtime safety for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and also he played for the Denver Broncos, and he's an excellent defensive football mind. So when you see the 49ers and how great their defense is playing, 
and how they got Richard Sherman, how they were able to draft uh, the Bosa's of the world and some of those big guys, nasty guys they got up front. The person who's behind like identity, everything runs through is John Lynch. John Lynch basically built that defense from the ground up, went out and got Quan Qu uh, Alexander from Tampa Bay. Like he made a lot of good uh, adjustments and good pickups because John Lynch knows what a great defense is because he was a great safety when he played for the Buccaneers and for the Broncos. And he was a um, he's an excellent defensive mind. And it looks like he's a great uh, talent evaluator. So that's what I'm saying with our with our group with Thomas Dimitrov. I don't necessarily going to say he need to be fired because I never want to call for anybody's job. Um, but I feel like Thomas Dimitrov has made some sketchy moves and some sketchy picks over the years. And I also feel that maybe uh, Dan Quinn didn't have a say on some of these players that were drafted. And maybe he did want some defensive, uh, wanted to draft some defensive linemen. But Thomas Dimitrov wouldn't, have, you know, wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't do it. They couldn't come to agreement on it. So they had to just agree to disagree type situation. And maybe that's why these guys are struggling. Like maybe that's the, the reason we're not seeing what we want to see. As far as I know for me. I've been wanting to see more big guys on this team, more defensive uh, tackles, stronger players up front because Vic Beasley and Tap McKinley, those guys are not cutting it right now. So with that being said, um, don't have too much more to go in this video. I just wanted to give you guys something to think about, you know, with the Thomas Dimitrov deal. Um, as far as Dan Quinn goes, I feel like him and Thomas Dimitrov are kind of attached at the hip at this point. Doesn't mean that um, one of them won't be let go at the end of the season, whether it's Thomas Dimitrov or Dan Quinn. If you ask me, I think I would get rid of uh, Thomas Dimitrov for, before I would get rid of Dan Quinn because I feel like some of these players that's been drafted and selected were not good draft picks by um, were not good draft picks by Thomas Dimitrov. So he did have a, a lot of good draft picks like the Keanu Neal pickup. And uh, De uh, Deion Jones and Grady Jarrett. We do have a couple diamonds in the rough, but I just feel like some of these uh, some of these uh, players that we've drafted hasn't panned out, man. Hasn't panned out uh, or hasn't panned out yet. So, like I was saying before, um, I don't know, you know, how much uh, how much Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov talk and. You know, if Dan Quinn has any power about who we draft. But I feel like I know at one point, I think it was last year, the year before that, they were saying that Dan Quinn was interested in Taven Bryant. And Taven Bryant would definitely be able to help us up front if he was our nose tackle. Or we could put him right next to Grady Jarrett. So I don't know at those times where, where um, I don't know in, in those times if Dan Quinn brung it to Thomas Dimitrov, like stayed in, hey, I want to draft this guy or whether it was all Thomas Dimitrov basically like saying, no, we're going to draft this guy. You know what I'm saying? Whether Dan Quinn had a choice. So Bill Parcells basically said at one point when I think it was either he was coaching the, uh, the Patriots or when he was coaching the Cowboys, he talked about if you want me to cook the dinner, let me shop for some of the groceries or let me shop for the groceries. So basically what he's saying is if you want me to be able to put together a masterpiece or put put together my defense you need to let me make some decisions you know what i'm saying and that's all i'm saying about in this in this situation is i hope dan quinn hasn't been handcuffed meaning he's wanted some of these free agents and stuff like that and thomas dimitrov shot it down but dan quinn has to go out here and coach these thomas dimitrov players like the the players that thomas dimitrov thought would be the best players to run his scheme and uh, you know for him to coach i hope it was a balanced situation where both of them were you know involved and it wasn't just you know uh all thomas dimitrov's way or the highway you know i hope it was definitely like a 50 50 uh decision because at the end of the day if dan quinn's going to save his job he's going to need those players to perform and what i've been seeing with this Atlanta falcons team is a lot of poor execution inexperience which you know excuse me Inexperience, you know, that's one of the main things that I'm seeing with this team. It's just a lot of inexperience, a lot of young players on defense, a lot of busted coverages and things of that nature where teams are just, you know, still trying to get things figured out, you know, still trying to get things figured out. So 
with that being said um that's all i pretty much have for this video if you like the video please like share subscribe this your boy jew um as always rise up falcons nation i have a video later on um later on in the week it is saints week and i'm ready for the game on sunday but i have another video uh, video for y'all um also if you would like to donate to the channel y'all can go to my um i was gonna go to my cash app it'll be the dollar sign jew talk sports but uh, this has been my time y'all like i said if you if you would like to leave a comment or you have any questions that you would like me to answer definitely leave a comment I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have about our, uh, our Atlanta Falcons or maybe any other team. Maybe something you saw over the weekend in another game. You may have a question or something like that. Don't hes uh, hesitate to contact uh, me by just go ahead and uh, leaving, a, um, you know, leaving uh, something there in the chat. And I definitely would uh, get back to you. But this has been my time, y'all. This your boy, Jew. I'm out. Y'all enjoy the week. Peace.